buy stock is the topic of today's presentation. And some of you may be quick to point out that SPY isn't actually a stock. SPY is an ETF. And the reason that we've chosen this title SPY stock is because so many people search for that. So lots of people don't distinguish between SPY being a stock or an ETF. So let's start talking about the rise of indices and ETFs. So this is a great chart from Bloomberg. It's well, it's about six years old, but it, uh, it was remarkable when it came out because I found this hard to believe. The rise of the benchmark. So you can see here that the total number of indices out there actually exceeds the total number of stocks. And an index is simply a collection of stocks. So let's talk a little bit about indices. Index, as I said, is a back basket of stocks with an associated methodology. So I worked for the world's uh, leading provider of global indices, MSCI, for over a decade. And I became very familiar with how indices are used for any number of reasons, typically for benchmarking and to create financial products. So if you're somebody that's managing money and your clients want to judge how well you're doing, they can simply look at a benchmark and say, well, if you're actively managing, so there's a difference between active and passive management. Active is when you actively try to beat a benchmark, and passive is when you simply track that benchmark. So some examples of indices. You've got growth versus value. We did a presentation. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video that talks about the difference between those two. It's quite interesting. Then you have regional. So you might invest in European stocks or Asia or Latin America. Size, right? You can divide stocks up by their size, small, mid, and large. And those categorizations can actually differ based on geography where you might not have so many constituents. And then you can do a combination. So you could say European uh, small cap growth, right? You can start to slice and dice that universe. That's what we did at MSCI. So to make an index investable, because all an index is, is just a collection of stocks. It's just a paper output, a data output, if you will. In order to make that investable, you can create what's called an exchange traded fund. These large ETFs are typically passive, meaning they simply track that index. And there are tools, we used to sell them at MSCI, that people would use to manage ETFs and reduce their tracking error. That's the performance difference between your benchmark and what you're managing. And you don't have to go out and buy the exact basket of stocks. There are very clever ways of providing the same performance as an index. And there are even uh, some embedded ways there to create alpha for an organization. But th that starts to become very complex in a hurry. Now, ARK was notable, ARK Invest, for creating humongous active ETFs where they're not following a benchmark. Now, two of ARK's ETFs actually do. They're 3D printing one, and I think one other they have. But the remainder all are active, which means ARK moves in and out of stocks based on their inclinations and research. So these, of course, will command a lot higher fees. You've got more work, more costs, more analysts, et cetera. So when we look at the world's largest ETFs, so this is from Vetify. I believe this used to be ETF.com. It's a great resource. It says here, this is a good point, an ETF's assets will fluctuate based on both changes in the value of the underlying securities. That's intuitive, right? Your basket of stocks will all move and, and the the value of that basket will change based on what the, those, uh, those constituents do. And then it says here, uh, and the creation of new shares or redemption of existing shares. That's inflows and outflows. Your clients are putting money in or pulling money out. And it says here, it's worth noting there may be a difference between an ETF's market cap and the net asset value, meaning there, if you took the sum of the current value of the entire basket, it may be different than that what's calculated and traded on the index just by a small fraction. And they keep an eye on stuff like that. And of course, there's some arbitrage there that keeps that in line. So when we look at the largest ETFs out there, look at what's on top. SPY. So it's the Spider S&P 500 ETF Trust. It has over $400 billion in assets under management. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So we can just go to the website that hosts all the collateral for this ETF here. And you can see where uh, there's some, some interesting bits here. So first of all, 
the gross expense ratio of less than a tenth of a percent is very, very low. So the reason that they can lower that fee so low is because they have so much assets, right? And you do the math on that, they're making a lot of money on this ETF. You can see here the bullet points, I've highlighted a couple bits here, corresponds generally to the price and yield performance of the S&P 500 index. So that makes us wonder, well, what's the S&P 500 index that this is tracking? Because it's giving you that performance. And it describes it a bit. It says, it's a large cap U.S. index that holds companies across all 11 GICs sectors. GICs stands for Global Industry Classification Standard, and that's one of the things that we built at MSCI alongside S&P. And it is classifies stocks based on industry and analysts do the work, although I imagine we're now screen scraping all that stuff, or they are. Um, we had started screen scraping it when I had left, but um, you can classify all the, the world's companies into these 11 sectors based on where their revenues come from. And this was, I didn't know this, the first exchange traded fund listed in the United States. So it has uh, uh, quite uh, an acclaim there. So it's the first and biggest ETF out there. So when we look at performance, remember I said that they're simply trying to track the performance of a benchmark? Well, look, they show you here. Just focus on the top table there. It says there, let's take the, the, the two lines, the bottom two lines in the top table, market value and benchmark. Take that all the way out to the right. You can see since inception, the performance of this ETF versus the benchmark. So they're nearly identical. And you can read to, for, uh, across there uh, to the left and see that they're nearly identical. So they do a great job of tracking that index. And then when you go below that, the table below shows what happens after the tax man takes his dollar. Uh, so this is, as I said, the 500 largest companies listed on stock exchanges in the United States. So it's a fixed list. And of course, that will change based on the market caps of companies. And as any index provider does, they'll have a rebalancing methodology and people will pay very close attention to that because this is one of the most commonly followed equity indices. Here you can see the fund's top holdings and the index's top holdings. Because this is such a large fund, it nearly mimics the index perfectly. So we don't, what we would typically do when we're analyzing an ETF is to go look at the index to get the purest data on what we're investing in. But these two are, are nearly the same, as you can see. And what do you notice right off? Well, it's very tech heavy, right? These are the, the top weightings. And we can look at a sector breakdown. Indeed, it is. Look, we have nearly 28% there in information technology. Next is healthcare, then financials, and consumer discretionary, right? And it goes down the list. So you're taking a pretty tech-heavy bet. Now, when we look at the performance of SPY, remember we said it's one of the most commonly used benchmarks out there. It's important to note, if we go back to that performance table and take a quick look, since inception in January of 1993, 10% annualized returns are really remarkable. So if you just held this heavily diversified ETF over that time, you would have done quite well. Now, where are we at in that cycle? Well, the I put up this chart here to show that the Current price is below the all-time highs. So it goes something like this. A bear market is typically when SPY or any asset or any benchmark goes more than 20% below its high point. Then you're in a bear market. And then the idea is that it needs to then, you would measure when it comes up and, and creates a new high again. So we haven't done that yet, right? See how it's flirting with that, but it, it started to, to, to retract again. So that's one measure. And then you could also say, well, it goes more than 20% above its last high water mark. So typically, when it breaks that high water mark, then the bear market is over. And I put some interesting statistics here about how the shortest bear market lasted just 33 days. That was the Rona. And you can see that blip there, right? Uh, between 2020 and 2021, see that sharp spike downwards? That was a bear market that lasted uh, just over a month. That's remarkable. And nobody expected, myself included, I mean, everybody thought that, gee, that was going to sustain over time. And look, it just kept on marching upwards. And, you know, it's anybody's guess where this is going to go, which is why it's about time in the market, not timing the market. You'll never be able to predict how this moves. 
And then I put some other interesting bits here. So the S&P 500 has experienced 21 bear markets, uh, approximately one every 4.5 years on average. The average length of a bear market is 388 days. So since that last high water mark there in 2022, uh, we're somewhere around coming up on two years in this current bear market. And uh, to put that into perspective here, I pulled up some data on the longest bear market since World War II, and you can pause the presentation and read these. As I said, uh, a bear market is defined by a prolonged drop in investment prices, uh, falls by 20% or more from its recent high. So another thing that investors in SPY stock, or the SPY ETF, as more correctly put, uh, another thing they would want to know about is the Yield. So you actually, I think right now the yield for SPY is 1.49%. Now you're not investing in this um, specifically for yield, but it's a, a return component that you ought to pay attention to. And here you can see yield charted over time. And it's very intuitive. When stock prices drop or SPY drops, the yield increases. Okay. So these two points here that I've highlighted in yellow. That first one is the 2008-2009 housing crisis, and you can see how high yield went. That's because SPY, the collect, that basket of stocks, dropped so much. And then, of course, the last bear market was the Rona, when everything just absolutely dumped, and you can see the effect that had on the yield. So just to conclude, uh, the best approach to investing in SPY stock would be to use dollar cost averaging to accumulate in both good times and bad, because as you saw on the, on the performance slide, it's all about time in the market. Be aware, if you're going to invest in this ETF heavily, that your overweight large cap in technology, if you chose just to invest in SPY, all right, you'd be overweight large caps, of course, these are the largest companies, and technology, we saw that slide, 28%, right? What are you also overweight? The United States. So you need to pay attention to that. And what you can do is, we've done presentations on this, looked at a picture of the globe and broken down all the stock markets in the world into percentages. And there's a certain percentage you ought to have in the United States. And I think Japan is the next emerging market or developed. Then you have Germany, et cetera. So maybe consider a mixture of ETFs to provide some diversification. And I'll put a link to a couple videos we've done relating to this. Now, plenty of Muppets out there are going to try to get you to trade options on SPY. Don't do it. Don't get involved in that rubbish. And it's very popular now for people on Robinhood to be pushing options and talking about how much money they're making. They'll never tell you how much they're losing, how much money they're making on options. Don't do it. Be an investor, not a speculator. And always remember, it's about time in the market, not timing the market. Now, I've put up another video here you might like. Before you watch that, please click the Nanalyze logo on the right. Support our work. We don't run ads, so it's very helpful when you share our content and like it. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.